I did a video recently uh, as a patient um, doing a watch, watch pat measurement on myself. Um, what is watch pat? Uh, what's it look for? Is it does it work? Is it any good? Um, it's a it's a sleep study device. Um, but before we get into all of those questions, and what were my my readings, by the way? Um, <clears throat> I do have some sleep issues, um, and we'll talk about those in just a minute. But first, a brief introduction. Ford Brewer, PrevMed, uh, P-R-E-V-M-E-D, heart risk. Um, we're basically here to help our patients prevent heart attack, stroke, um, and the purpose of this channel is to provide a lot of the science behind prevention. So what is WatchPat? The, <clears throat> excuse me, the WatchPat, is a device. Now, <clears throat> pardon this big blue picture of a brain that's supposed to, I think, I think supposed to show sleeping. This came off of the WatchPat um, website. And for some reason, every page you print out from that website shows this big blue brain. Um, I would suggest you go to the WatchPat um, website yourself. Now, the watch pad is basically a sleep device. Um, <clears throat> and again, the, here's the basic components. It's a pulse oximetry with a central um, sleep uh, motion detector, and it measures you through the night. Now, let's go, let's go back just a second. What is pulse oximetry? Well, <clears throat> look it up in Wikipedia. It's very simple. Pulse oximetry has been around for a very long time. It's just a, a, a device, usually a watch type of device with um, a sensor on the end. The sensor for you uh, science geeks, um, in fact, here is the Wikipedia website, and doesn't that look familiar? So we're talking about basically a standard pulse ox. Um, inside this sensor, this is done down at excuse me, the finger, um, it's done in a thin place in the skin. On babies, especially newborns, for example, we, we do it on the feet because the, thin, uh, the skin is so thin and it's easier to get to. Now, you know, that, it, and it's looking at light um, and the reflection of light, the color of the blood, or the light absorbance of the blood. You know that light, um, or that blood, when it, it is uh, saturated with oxygen, is a bright red. Also, for those of you who watched the Robin Cook movie of decades ago, carbon monoxide will also make uh, the blood a cherry red. But <clears throat> after the oxygen has been depleted from the blood, it's more of a dark, even bluish type of color. So the way the watch pad works is it, uh, it goes to a thin place in the skin, shoots light, two different uh, le um, frequencies, light frequency, wave frequencies of light, uh, through the skin and measures the uh, light absorbance. We've been using this for decades in medicine. You go to the ER, for example, these days, and they'll put a they'll put a uh, pulse ox on you. It's like uh, the the uh, fifth vital sign. Um, <clears throat> now, what else is involved with WatchPat? As I said, a um, a motion detector, which you put here, and <clears throat> um, with a routine uh, pulse ox, you just get an immediate reading. You don't get readings all night. So I think that's actually one of the valuable parts of the Itamar watch pad. You get a, a readout for the entire night. So <clears throat> what were my results? Here they are. I'm not going to go into detail on that. I'm going to go to the, uh, to the interpretations, but basically you're looking at pulse ox through the night. Uh, you're looking at the motion sensor. Um, they actually get into saying, um, they even try to interpret REM sleep. Now, <clears throat> and like most met biomedical manufacturers, they say the science behind, all, behind our product is impeccable. Is it really? Well, the science behind... Um, Pulse oximetry is impeccable, and it's uh, pulse oximetry is a pretty standard um, commodity type uh, technology now. So, 
the technology, I think, behind the pulse oximetry is very reliable. Uh, the sleep sensor, <clears throat> maybe okay. I, um, not quite so much. And then going all the way to rapid eye movement sleep, REM sleep, which is incredibly important. Um, I don't think, I'm a little bit skeptical of the technology. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Let's go through the report real quick. Dr. Hartrick sent me this report, sleep study. Um, <clears throat> Apnea hypopnea index. Mine was 8.6. Those of you who have seen and heard about sleep studies know that that's not too bad. Uh, the goal is to be less than five. Um, I have a family member that's over 30 all night long. Um, significant issues. <clears throat> they have another uh, index, resp respiratory disturbance index, which is a lighter component uh, where you have micro or very short losses of sleep. The larger losses of sleep are 10 or more seconds when you're having obstruction. Um, <clears throat> these, uh, the, the smaller one, the RDI, which should also be less than five, sec uh, five for me is 23. In other words, I have a lot of um, mild, uh, airway obstruction episodes. That's the way to interpret this. Um, and I'll show you on the graphs in just a minute. <clears throat> I don't have a lot of serious respiratory uh, um, obstruction episodes. And I can tell you, I, it's because of this and some of the sleep hygiene things I've done. I used to have far worse. Um, when I say this, I actually have At 60 years old, I'm, I've gotten braces for the first time in my life. I'll do another video on that later, but what those braces have done, the purpose was for sleep, and what they've done is spread out my arch and moved my teeth out. My tongue is no longer pushing back into my airway. So, <clears throat> again, another reason to think about your teeth in terms of your health and in terms of uh, sleep being a... Uh, a component of that. Now they looked at my oxygen desaturation rate. Um, in other words, my pulse ox. That is the technology out of this watch pad that I think is by far the most reliable. Mine was was perfect. It was uh, like one, one and a half percent and uh, you're wanting uh, less than five. So very good uh, at keeping uh, my blood oxygenated. Now, here's where they, <clears throat> they said of REM sleep, I got one and a half percent. One and a half percent of my sleep time was REM sleep. They also said I was asleep for eight hours or I was lying down for eight hours. I slept for seven and a half. I can tell you, number one, I'm skeptical of, uh, of the REM sleep, as I said before. I think that's something that needs to have um, electrodes. That's how we measure it. We're looking, REM stands for rapid eye movement, and there's no sensor on the watch pad that really looks at eye movement. A couple of things about me and my diagnosis. I'm actually very, um, I'm not totally surprised because of the improvement I've had with my braces. I've also done a ton of work in terms of sleep hygiene. We have a lot of sleep hygiene uh, resources on the channel and in the forum. John uh, Lorscheider, uh, uh, has listed it several times. I've done a lot of sleep hygiene over the past couple of years and it's worked. I'm sleeping a lot better. Um, <clears throat> just as a reminder, I have insulin resistance and atrial fib. Despite having a BMI of about, of about 21 uh, for forever, and I've been a plant, and for those of you who are uh, plant-based groupies, you know, plant-based fans. I've been plant-based for 30 years. So I'm thin. I developed uh, uh, insulin resistance even though I was a poster board for good dietary health and good exercise, a uh, marathon runner and that sort of thing. Why? Well, I think it was uh, a couple of things. Genetics, um, EMA, 
early morning awakening. Uh, <clears throat> my whole life, I have routinely uh, tended to wake up at 2 or 3 in the morning, uh, probably 60% of the days. Um, early morning awakening sounds like a description of a sleep pattern. It's actually a discrete sleep pattern uh, problem. I'm I have found out years ago that my dad had the same thing. My dad, on the other hand, despite being my, my height, 5'10", also weighed over 300 pounds. I weigh 150. So um, <clears throat> a lot of other reasons for my dad to have the heart disease that he had. So <clears throat> on a personal basis, yes, I've had early morning awakening. So, uh, you know, maybe there is some truth to or evidence behind the um, some of the problems that they're showing that they're showing here. Although again, I don't think those are very bad. I've already described my teeth, and I'm going to just make one other comment regarding epigenetics. We talk about genetics many times as a reason for heart disease, even though, like me, you may may be um, thin and have really good uh, health habits. Age is the is the critical piece, um, and insulin resistance is going on with along with that age. There's growing evidence that uh, it's not so much a change or a type in, of the DNA, although I do have 9p21, the heart attack gene, but it's a thing called epigenetics. Uh, I was a baby, um, ten and a half pounds. We didn't know that when I was born, but we know now that either being born to a mother with uh, gestational, hyper, uh, uh, gestational uh, hyperglycemia, gestational diabetes, or having being over eight pounds greatly increases your risk of developing type two diabetes when you're older. Well, <clears throat> I was 10 and a half pounds. And if you go back to my genetics classes, um, We've, we've known for the past few years that using epigenetics, if you, make, if you take a lab rat, make that lab rat uh, obese, the next generation or two will have much uh, increased risk for diabetes. So again, there's a lot, of thing, a lot of things that are getting tied together in terms of our science today, in terms of sleep, uh, genetics somewhat, but more of a, a focus on epigenetics and the link between lifestyle and uh, disease as we get older. Now, I said <clears throat> I will go through some of the graphs instead of the raw data on um, my information. So the bottom line is uh, we talked about very serious uh, apnea or airway obstruction episodes, and we talked about minimal ones. I have a uh, few, but not very many, serious ones, moderate. But I have a lot of uh, very minimal type of um, sleep apnea type of episodes. Sleep apnea <clears throat> and risk factors. Uh, I've uh, done several videos on the fact that I have atrial fib. Uh, two of the major precipitating events for uh, fibrillation, uh, and you know I have the 4Q25 gene, which we have seen as a risk. I've also been a an endurance uh, athlete, albeit a weekend athlete. Again, both of those are major risk factors, but for immediate episodes of atrial fib, there are two big things. One is high blood pressure, and the other is sleep apnea. So, <clears throat> I'm hitting you with a lot of science real quick. Um, what's the overall in terms of um, me, well, I'm not going to go through that right now. What's the, the purpose for that is what's the overall in terms of um, the Itamar watch pat? Well, I think, the, I think it's a useful tool. Um, it gives you a great pulse ox uh, reading and very reliable through the entire sleep period. How about the apnea episodes? I think those are probably pretty good. I think they're a really good indicator. What about... Uh, um, Rapid eye movement. I think it's really a stretch to think you're going to get significant rapid eye movement uh, measurement out of the watch pad. Thank you for your intention, interest.